so this is what's so crazy is when you say bismuth, I think of the magnesium bismuth parts yep. that uh, Gary Nolan has in his lab. And I think of the magnesium bismuth that um, Lewis Witten in front of a crash. Lewis Witten is working at Martin Corporation's anti-gravity division. He says that he was contracted by Wright Airfield to work on gravity. And he said that there was a guy named Townsend who had a weird isotope of bismuth that exhibited anti-gravity properties. And bismuth shows up in Townsend Brown's papers as, he didn't use the word topological insulator, but as a high K dielectric in his capacitor experiments. And so he's using high energy and applying it to this insulator. And yeah. so that's fascinating. Bismuth is an inherently topological dopant to different semiconductor materials. So when you have a lattice, which can be a, met a metallic conductor or an insulator or a semiconductor, it has this band gap between the valence electrons and the conduction electrons. In a conductor, they overlap, there's no gap. In an insulator, they're quite far apart. They don't jump on their own with thermal energy. In a semiconductor, they're very close topological insulator is kind of a, a warping of the semiconductor definition in that that band gap can move and change. If you apply a B field, if you warm it up, if you do different, cool it down, if you do different things to it, you can, it could be individual quantum states, the, the band gap. But the issue is you can apply an external field and it stops being an insulator and turns into something special. <laughs> and what's unobtainium. It? Um, turns into unobtainium by any other means. And what does that something special involve as far as its properties? What can that well, something example, special do? Well, for example, the right metamaterial with an external magnetic field on it might emit uh, positive and negative matter that you can drive the warp field with. Wow. And so with negative mass, you could theoretically affect uh, kind of the, the, the quantum vacuum yes. and you could create a gradient that you could sort of surf. You could surf space-time itself. Is that Yes, kind of right. that's, one of that's, one, that's one of the notions. That's the Alcubierre notion. You can have a gradient that you can surf surf on across yeah. space. Pais but, describes it as being sucked into space-time or into the vacuum, like you're slitting open an envelope and it pulls you in. It's kind of interesting. So fascinating. But we're, we're at the beginning of the science because it's been covered up and unfunded for so long. It's amazing. I think there's a convergence of that science and consciousness stuff. The consciousness stuff is full of snake oil and woo-woo BS. Except, like, except where Donald Hoffman is. Well, except for Donald Hoffman and I think a lineage of what's called parapsychology at elite universities yeah. in mid-century where they're studying basically random or conventionally thought of as random quantum mechanical effects like radioactive isotope decay and seeing that there is an ability for the mind to affect in a statistically significant way you know, the output of ones or zeros on kind of a graphical if, if interface. People, people that that knee-jerk reaction, that, that can't happen, need to go read the peer-reviewed hundred or so papers written by Dean Radin, mm. demonstrating conclusively these effects are real. I, I couldn't agree more. I, one of my close mentors who couldn't be more credible as far as like, what he does in the in the real world and i think we're going to come out with an interview soon uh was very involved in the princeton parapsychology lab and and their random event generator experiments yes, yes, yes and i've hit him with every single skeptical you know file drawer issue survivorship bias p hack you know whatever and like he has great answers for all of it and at a certain point you have to be like well that can't exist because I don't want it to exist. And actually, yeah, maybe, there, maybe there's something there. there. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. me. I had to be converted to be convinced that there's something here, but there's it, definitely something there. And I think the thing that is there, the physical possible model of consciousness would be if the Penrose thing is right. So if, if there's something in the brain that can maintain quantum coherence, and then it kind of, you know, uh, decoheres, and then you see reality in this kind of macroscopic relativistic way, mm -hmm then you're sort of rendering reality in real time. As, as, you, as you live it, you render it. Exactly. You're, uh, it's, and it comports fully with the Wheeler observer theory of the universe model. So if you are responsible for the, the rendering, and it's, but that decoherence is going on in your mind, then your ability to affect matter isn't like you're like shooting particles out at the material world. It's you're affecting the rendering of the material world, if that makes sense. Like you are the interface, it's going on inside the mind. So distance is not affected. 
So distance is not a factor, which is all the quantum stuff. Distance is not a, distance okay. and time are not a factor. You have Absolutely. temporal and spatial non-locality. You almost kind of need something like this <laughs> to get from to get from here. You need an effect that appears to take place in a realm where to, where distance is not uh, a limiting factor. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Which in all the random event generator experiments, time and distance don't matter. Right. And it's so it's it's really made. So how do you guys think? If you have on the one side, you have kind of consciousness stuff. And then on the other side, you have, you know, exotic propulsion, high energy physics. Do you guys think they converge anywhere? You know, so I've been into the um, work of Hoffman now for three years. Yeah. And he's come up with this model of consciousness in a, a challenge from um, a famous physicist at Princeton. Uh, who told him, I need you to show me that your model of consciousness might be able to uh, be based upon or utilize what's called decorated permutations because they are involved in a physical object called amplitudehedrons, which are relevant to modern, current, ongoing quantum physics. Okay. So... This is, is a really interesting model, and Toffin is brilliant at describing how you get from this gigantic collection of conscious agents uh, that are implemented in these permutations that are decorated with other information, project down to each of us individually to, to, to give us our space-time rendering that's our a desktop that we view the universe through. But we all are derived from this up here. So his theory from the outset requires a universal consciousness pool. All right, so that's interesting. So then over here, you've got Wolfram and his team uh, with a brilliant physicist writing papers in it who have taken hypergraphs which are basically structures for programs and so forth, computational structures. And they have now worked out in peer-reviewed papers how you can take one of these hypergraphs and keep twiddling it and working on it until you get down to, ooh, what I've got here is I've built from code the general theory of relativity. And you do it over here slightly differently, and you get down to, I've run this code and done all this work, and what came out of it is quantum field theory. So I asked the following question. Is it ever going to be possible to connect the information field that's being manipulated by consciousness to all the stuff over here? So I asked the following technical question. Is very technical answer. Is there a mathematical connection between decorated permutations and hypergraphs? And I found a mapping through certain permutations that directly map from the decorated permutations onto the components in the hypergraph. And that's my only result so far, but it's the beginning of how you marry consciousness, if he has the right model, to physics if they have the right model. So for me, it might be, it might be string theory. It might be something a goofy, crazy mathematician would do, but it's really enticing. And I have this mechanism written down and I'm writing it up. Cause I just wow. did it last week. That's incredible. Yeah. And he, he described it to me on the train over and I was kind of mind blown actually. We got to get you and him and Pines in the same room to go over the hypergraph connection because Wow. It, yeah, I'll just, I'll, I, I, I'll let you guys go. <laughs> it was soup to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, Pines. P M Pines, if you're seeming, <laughs> you're amazing. Let's talk. Oh, uh, let's do it. Let's do it. We'll do, we'll do uh, part three yeah. with, with well, all of us. Yes. That yeah. sounds like a blast. Yeah. Well, it'll be, uh, this is, this, but what, what people are seeing is this kind of conversation and that kind of interaction. Yeah. It's how scientists work together. They have ideas, they bounce them off each other, they write them down, they make mistakes, they correct each other, they're hard on each other, they're supportive of each other, and in the end, we get somewhere. I don't know that this is gonna go anywhere, but I, you, you, 
as when you're a scientist, in my case, a mathematician, and you're working on something and you have this notion and you sit down and all of a sudden this chill washes over you. You feel the surge of adrenaline and you see your way through and you write it down and you go, I have figured out the connection between this and this, and here's how we do it. It's just this most unreal thing that happens to people in the moment of discovery. That's amazing.